Blast injuries to exposed personnel, represented by this dummy. So Tom Scott did this wonderful little video about why real explosions don't look like movie explosions. There is one kilo of Semtex plastic explosive back there. This ought to look good. It's well worth watch and goes into some detail about how these explosive experts set up these big fire explosions in safe ways. But in many ways, it's more about how they make these explosions than why they look different. I mean, what the hell is an explosion in any event? And is that really even a kilo of explosive? How could you tell? Well, it turns out quite easily, and I'm going to show you how. But let's start with the first question. What the hell is an explosion, and why are they dangerous? Well, all regular explosions are just a rapid expansion of gas. Could have deadly consequences. For Good Morning America. It doesn't really matter whether you're looking at bangers or nukes. It's mostly the gas pressure that does the damage. How much gas pressure? Well, it turns out not a lot. One atmosphere extra of pressure is more than enough to make a mess of most buildings. Uh, reinforced concrete buildings severely damaged at merely 0.7 atmospheres of overpressure. And it's pretty harsh on people as well. Blast injuries to exposed personnel, represented by this dummy, is usually severe over 3 PSI. Here it was 6 PSI. Now I'm going to stick with the more intuitive units here of atmospheres of pressure, because we all know what one atmosphere of pressure feels like. It's what we live under all the time. Now a lot of people will raise an eyebrow at that. You know, hang on, if I'm under one atmosphere of pressure all the time, how can only half an atmosphere difference actually blow me around like this? Well, the truth is that one atmosphere is actually quite a lot of force. One atmosphere of pressure is equal to about 10 tons per square meter. And seeing as your average human has a skin area of about two square meters, this means that the pressure on the outside of your body is about 20 tons. So if you get hit by a one atmosphere pressure wave on the front, but not on the back, this is like getting hit by 10 tons on your front, but not having anything to equilibrate it on the back. And then there's one other slight thing that I should have mentioned. Pressure waves like this travel at about the speed of sound. Actually, the very first ones emitted can be supersonic, but they very rapidly slow down to being at about the speed of sound. The only redeeming grace here is they don't hit you for very long. But for structures with lots of surface area, where they can't exchange the air with from the inside and the outside very quickly, these things tend to be absolutely devastating. But it also means that we can actually do some fairly interesting calculations. So for instance, with this piece of footage here, you see the flash, and about three seconds later, the pressure wave arrives and destroys things. So we know that sound travels at about 300 meters per second, so the bomb was set off about one kilometer away from this house. That's not actually that far. Or with this one, we can see instantly that someone has messed around with the sound. Blast injuries to exposed personnel because the earliest you could possibly hear the sound is when the shockwave actually arrives. Actually, even that's not entirely true. You see, sound can travel through the ground as well as through the air. And through the ground, it travels about 10 times quicker than it does through the air. This will become very relevant later when we're dealing with things like high explosives. It can also be seen in some fairly dramatic examples in real life like the explosion in Beirut. Now, I should stress that all of these people ended up completely fine, but it makes a wonderful example of how sound travels through the earth much quicker than it does through the air. Hi. Yeah, I should stress, beyond the screaming, they ended up being fine. So when the explosion goes off, the ground starts to shake first. Hi because the shock wave goes through the earth much more quickly. So we'll call when the ground starts to shake when the explosion happened. So the shock wave is delivered at the speed of sound, about 300 meters per second. So we just look at the time difference between when the ground shakes and when you hear the explosion, and you can immediately calculate 
how far away from the explosion they were. Let's say about four seconds, sound troubles about a third of a kilometer per second, that sort of thing. You're looking at about one and a half kilometers. And what was it in reality? About three. Yeah, I mean, for these ballpark numbers, that's not bad. But even these old schooly information type films can't but help sync up the explosion with when the explosion actually happens. Even though you wouldn't hear the explosion until the shockwave hits you. Blast injuries to exposed personnel represented by this dummy. And no, you can't hear the explosion till the sound gets there. Like this. Blast injuries to exposed personnel represented by this dummy is usually... Yes, that wasn't actually a nuclear explosion, by the way, that guy was standing in front of. That was a conventional explosion because the military wanted to calibrate their nuclear weapons. And what better way to calibrate your nuclear weapons on, say, 500 tons of TNT? Those little white trails, by the way, going across in front of us are actually smoke rockets, and they're used to track where the blast wave is. And they're actually a fairly common occurrence in a lot of the early nuke tests. Cool. So that's all an explosion is, is the generation of a pressure wave, which you can either do by heating the gas up very quickly in the case of a nuke, or generating lots of gas very quickly in the case of chemical explosives, which also generate quite a lot of heat. But maybe is an interesting time to come on to, did Tom Scott actually blow up a kilo of explosives there? How could you tell? Well, there's a couple of fairly useful benchmarks that you can use here. The first one is if you turn something from being a solid or a liquid into a gas, there's roughly an expansion ratio of a factor of a thousand for most conventional things. And also, explosives tend to release quite a lot of heat. You know, sort of very diabetic flame temperatures of a few thousand degrees, that sort of thing. So this means that you get an expansion ratio of about 10,000 off of conventional explosives. So one kilo of explosives is about one liter, and an expansion ratio of 10,000 gives you an expected fireball size of 10 cubic meters. That's roughly two meters by two meters by two meters. People are about two meters tall, so we can see that the fireball here is about mm, 10 cubic meters, that sort of thing. So this all checks out really quite well. Ah, but the second explosion in the Tom Scott video, the, the fiery explosion, the Hollywood explosion, was much bigger, much more fiery. To which the answer is, yes, the second explosion had a lot more energy in it. There's a rough approximation, an equivalent mass of explosive contains about the same energy. So a litre of gasoline contains about the same energy as a litre of Semtex. There is one kilo of Semtex plastic explosive back there. Actually turns out the gasoline has much more energy in it, but only when it's been burned in the air. So you only have to eyeball it that there is several litres of gasoline in the fireball, whereas there is only one litre of Semtex in the explosion. So the main difference here is a question of rates. The way high explosives work is they generate the gas at about the speed of sound in a solid, which you'll recall is about 10 times the speed of sound in a gas. Imagine you have a fictional explosive. These are the molecules of that fictional explosive viewed up real close, and the proportions of the space filling is about right here for a solid. Now, for something to detonate, it requires that when one of these molecules decomposes, that the molecules that it decomposes into actually trigger the decomposition of adjacent molecules. So when the first molecule decomposes, it creates two molecules of gas. And the decomposition gives those molecules a lot of energy. They come off hot and they immediately slam in to the adjacent molecules and cause them to decompose. And those slam into the molecules around those and cause them to decompose. So the rate that this decomposition spreads throughout the solid is basically the speed that molecules collide with each other in a solid, which is basically what the speed of sound in a solid is, which is basically why all of these explosives detonate at about a few kilometers per second. Yeah, pentaethyl tetranitramine, a high explosive, and when this stuff goes off, it will detonate along its length at about six kilometers a second. Now you can also see why it really doesn't matter how complex the molecules you are detonating are. 
because at the end of the day, they're all going to decompose into essentially diatomic molecules. So if I make it up of more complicated molecules, you're still going to mostly end up with diatomic molecules at the end. I just drew this small fictional explosive because it was easier to draw. Now it turns out you can get similar things, but with air. That is, if you get a mixture of a flammable gas and an oxidant, this will also happily explode in a very similar way to the way that the solid did. You know, apart from here, the rate of the explosion is essentially the speed of sound in a gas, which is yeah, 10 times slower than the speed of sound in a solid. But the effects of the pressure wave are basically exactly the same. Indeed, this is the concept of the fuel air bomb, where you get a fuel and you aerosolize it with a burst charge, then you ignite it. So why didn't Dom's mixture do this? Well, because they didn't mix enough air in there with it. Their burst of charges were deliberately set such that it would be a fuel-rich burn. You can see that it takes several seconds for the fuel to mix with the oxygen and burn. However, if that had been aerosolized, it would have combusted at about the speed of sound. And for these sorts of cameras, it would have looked identical to the Semtex explosion. Incidentally, I should point out that even high-speed cameras don't help out that much while trying to film detonations like this. I mean, I've got some fairly decent high-speed cameras that look up to yeah, 50,000 frames per second at a acceptable resolution. And what did I say detonation speeds were? Five kilometers per second, 5,000 meters per second, that sort of thing. That means that you're only gonna get a frame every 10 or so centimeters of a detonation of an explosive. That means you're only gonna get about three frames for the entirety of this Semtex detonation. At which point we can maybe come on to why one of these gives a big fiery flame and the other one apparently gives almost nothing. Cool. So what we got here is a butane flame burning with pure oxygen. So as you see, there's no real orange color to the flame at all. And uh, just give you some idea of what this flame will do. It's about 2,000, 3,000 degrees, that sort of thing. About half the temperature of the surface of the sun. So if I put some borosilicate glass in there, you will see this stuff softens almost immediately. And if I just melt it a little bit, you'll see that it's actually pretty molten pretty quickly. All right? So what happens if I reduce the amount of oxygen that I'm putting in to this mix here. And you will see, it goes all red like that. So what's actually causing all that red color? Well, let me show you something. It's just a fairly common, useful thing in glass blowing. So quite often when you're doing glass blowing, uh, when the glass gets really hot and sort of molten, you need to cool it down nice and evenly. So once you've got it nice and hot like this, you want to cool it down. Yeah, it's just softened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it cool down like that. And you'll find that first nothing happens. And then as the glass slowly cools down, you start getting soot precipitating on the actual glass and that's what's giving you that nice uh, red color in the flame there and I can show you that's definitely carbon because if I go up to a hot flame again and let's go back into the flame see what happens you'll see that fairly quickly you can just burn the carbon off again. So, there is basically nothing left and you have beautiful clean glass again. Now the skeptically minded among you might say, hang on, from the second you put the glass into the flame it went all red. Well no, that's actually a different phenomena some oxygen into this flame. I'm just going to get a little bit of oxygen in there for starters. I'm just going to move that in there. So, there's not much to it. There is a bit of clean up on, on the sodium starting to come off there. But if I actually crank this up a bit, you start to get this really bright orange glow off that. I've melted the glass a bit. So, 
Now, what you'll find is when I put the glass specs on, that it almost completely cuts out the sodium glare. You can actually see what you're doing on the glass. Now, the reason it can do this is because this is sodium uh, borosilicate glass, and that's got sodium in it. So what's happening here is the sodium ions are evaporating off the glass and then they're ionizing in here. So if you actually do a spectra of this, what you'll find is there's actually only one really sharp, well, it's actually two really sharp lines in here, and that's for the sodium uh, emission. And if you cut those out, like that, all you see is the very dull red heat of the glass. But importantly, when you look at the same reddish color of the flame through those same glasses, it has almost no effect on that red color of the flame. Because that red color is caused by very small, very hot soot particles. But are there any other ways that I could actually demonstrate that it was soot that was giving us that nice red color in the flame? Well, yes, yes there is. So everyone told me I was crazy when I ordered all of this atomized carbon because there's no possible conceivable use for it. I actually used it to demonstrate uh, how big virus particles were. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that if I just knock off little bits of soot into the flame, you get lots of orange color. So that's basically what all the orange color is is it's really small particles of soot in the flame. So another interesting thing is to take a look at these guys with an infrared camera. So infrared cameras generally tell you the heat of an object, but they're really not very good for things like flames because flames aren't good black bodies. A point that I can demonstrate wonderfully well by putting in something that is a black body into the flame. And when I do that, you will see that almost instantly yeah, it starts reflecting the, the real temperature of the flame, and you'll even see you know, some sparks in there. Cool. Now, what happens if I reduce the oxygen content of the flame? Oops. You will see that the sooty flame is actually more visible on the infrared camera than the completely oxidized flame. And this is because the, the soot particles in here are acting as a better black body than when, when there's nothing in there at all. Cool, so for comparison, I've actually got the butane oxygen flame here and a hydrogen oxygen flame here. Let's see if we can actually demonstrate Hydrogen oxygen is insanely hot. Oh, that's awesome. You actually see it atomizing into the flame. That is so cool. Yeah. So if I introduce some carbon into the flame, like this, you'll see that the hydrogen oxygen flame, which contains absolutely no carbon, has the same red glow to it. Light up like it's Christmas. Cool. So I hope you enjoyed that little insight into why things go boom. Thumbs up is always appreciated. Subscribing is always worth considering if you don't want to miss out on new uploads like this and as ever. If you really want to support the work of this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon and uh, thanks for watching.